Throughout the years, Chris Hansen's To Catch a Predator has seen the most creeps, and we're going to be looking at what happened to them after their appearance on the show. Let's talk about John Kennelly, who's most notable for getting confronted twice in a 24 hour period. He went by the online persona Special Guy 29 and was engaging in graphic conversations with a boy that he believed to be 14 years old. Eventually, they would meet up at the Sting House. During the first encounter, he showed up completely naked while carrying a 12 pack of beer. Without giving the decoy a chance to walk out, Chris Hansen would confront the man and question his behavior. When his private messages were exposed, John would cut him off mid-sentence and explain that he was simply just chatting, to which Chris Hansen would fire back at him and yell this. Me, I'm serious. I was just chatting. I was just chatting. You're sitting in this kitchen naked, John. That's a step beyond chatting, isn't it? John would later leave the house, in which it was assumed that he did learn his lesson, but this was totally wrong because he was back online chatting to minors within a 24 hour period after being caught. He kept the same name screen Special Guy 29, but changed his actual name to Shane. While texting the decoy, they agreed to meet at a local McDonald's. When he was confronted waiting outside, he was in shock and had to say this. I just came to get something to eat. And I have very seldom been at a loss for words. Sir, I just came but to I don't even know what to ask. John later explained that he was seeing a psychiatrist and that the reason behind his actions was due to a recent death in his family. The confrontation ends off with John walking to his car to drive away, but he wasn't going to be let off that easily. After this, the police raided his apartment to remove his computer. John Kennelly was arrested and charged by the Commonwealth for the use of communication systems to contact a minor. This carried a stance of up to 10 years in prison but the charges would change after he pled guilty. Instead, later that year in September 2006, he was suspended to a two-year prison sentence, three years of probation, lifetime registration as a sex offender, and was ordered to have no unsupervised contact with anyone under the age of 18. This wasn't the end of it, however. As seen in the second encounter, John never learned his lesson. In March 2007, just a year later, two 15-year-old girls encountered a man while walking around Cub Run Park. The man was later identified to be none other than John Kennelly. This time, he was charged with two counts of exposure and was arrested at an adult detention center for violating his previous probation. However, it was unknown whether or not he received more jail time or extended probation. So where is he now? As of June 2022, he was spotted by a To Catch a Predator fan at a hotel in southwestern Pennsylvania. The latest update regarding John was in October 2022, to which he was still unemployed according to the Virginia Sex Offender Registry. Now if you thought John getting caught twice was bad, just wait till you hear about Jesse Velez, who insisted he didn't text a 13 year old boy and pretended to act disgusted when his messages were read out to him. The 13 year old boy managed to find Jesse on Grindr within 20 minutes of the account's creation. After sending unsettling messages and requests, they planned to meet up. When Jesse arrived at the house, he seemed confused and told the boy that he looked much older. After requesting an ID from him, the boy insisted that he kept it in his mommy's purse, which he couldn't show at the time because she wasn't home. Chris Hansen would abruptly enter the kitchen and interrogate Jesse. He would ask him about the messages, and he would even show him nude pictures that he sent. Now, just take a look at his extraordinary acting skills. Oh my god, I did not know I even sent that. Ugh. Yeah, I did not know that. Who was right? Yeah, usually when I send a picture, like I have a bunch of pictures of me. Right. So I must have hit that, but I didn't really know why. So this was just one big mistake. In the end, Jesse Velez received 5 years in prison with 2 to serve and had to register as a sex offender for 10 years. Shortly after, Jesse would post a now deleted Facebook post apologizing for his actions, which came with a bunch of mixed reactions. Towards the end of his statement, he said, Other people want to look at me funny and call me names. Well you know, one thing you can do is look in the mirror and ask if bullying is going to hurt me. Stop holding my actions against me and let me deal with it, and don't judge me based on what you read. Yeah boy, Jesse. Now this to many made it seem that he didn't care about his actions at all, and it showed that he had absolutely no remorse. 
because essentially he was playing the victim. This was in 2016 however, and only two years later in April 2018, he would be released from prison shortly, but managed to find himself in prison once more in March 2020 for breach of peace in the second degree after someone filed a restraining order on him. And as of today, he's still currently awaiting trial. The only other piece of information I found out about him was in 2014 when his store got robbed. At the time, he owned a mobile phone store and was robbed twice in one night. One commenter stated, dude was doing the community a favor by keeping him away from phones. And well, were they wrong? Now let's look at one of the most notorious predators, Lauren Armstrong. After numerous chats and phone calls between Lauren and a decoy, both planned to meet up together. Lauren was extremely excited when arriving at the decoy's house, and it wasn't only because he was going to meet the girl, it was also his 37th birthday. When approached by Chris Hansen, he blamed his behavior on a previous catfishing relationship with a woman he knew as Amanda James. The conversation wouldn't continue that long as when Lauren attempted to escape, the officers quickly confronted him. During the police interviews, he willingly allowed them to look through his computer and through his truck despite knowing he had illegal evidence. It was only after they showed a nude picture of himself that he requested to see a lawyer. It only got worse for him when more evidence was brought up from his computer, and essentially he couldn't provide any answers for his actions. Because of this, Lauren ended up being charged and was facing a 20 year prison sentence. In order to reduce that sentence, he took a plea deal and instead, he was sentenced to 7 years, in which both state and federal levels of prison had to be served concurrently. He served 5 of those years and was later given lifetime probation, and on top of that, he had to identify as a registered sex offender. After being released from prison, Lauren decided to turn his life around. 2017, he created a YouTube channel that consisted of guitar, update, workout, and cooking videos. On top of this, he started a t-shirt business. His channel did receive some attention at first, but people only knew him for the wrong reasons. In an act of desperation, he decided to capitalize on this and promoted his business in numerous videos. One of the shirts he attempted to sell had the saying, don't yell at me, I'm sensitive. This was a contradiction to something he said while on the show. For legal reasons however, he couldn't make profit from the shirt since he used an image from the show, which would count as copyright. And another reason was the Son of Sam law, which is a regulation that prevents criminals from making money from their offenses. Now for some odd reason, someone actually bought the shirt for $40. While it was never confirmed it was shipped or not, that would technically be the only shirt ever sold, putting his business to failure. It was also during 2017 that there was a catfishing scandal against him. A person who identified themselves as Ramona tried to create a long distance relationship with him with the main purpose of exploring who he was as a person. Calls between them would be uploaded which exposed his private insecurities and even included his thoughts on his to catch a predator appearance. This was quickly shut down however, as other people attempted to catfish him and things eventually got out of control. It seemed that nothing was going right for Lauren and this would be proven even further in 2019. It was during this time that he was arrested once again after spending 5 years in a sex offender rehab class and not passing due to not taking responsibilities for his past actions. It was even reported that he showed up to one of the classes drunk, and this just proved that he wasn't taking it seriously. He could also no longer post on his YouTube channel as he wasn't allowed to access the internet due to his previous violations. It was also during this time in prison, he would write a novel titled Taken Abroad. But as expected, it received poor reviews due to people being aware of his backstory and not wanting to show any support to him whatsoever. He was hated so much that a religious group named the Church of Cod was created to intentionally mock him as they would use his crimes and past mistakes as a fake sense of worship, with even some members confronting him in person and shaming him. Two years later in May 2021, a video emerged that showed Lauren selling items at a garage sale with people once again humiliating him by saying quotes from his To Catch a Predator appearance. The last update was in January 2023 in which the Church of Cod group pointed out on Google Maps that he no longer resides in Cornville, Arizona, as his trailer that he was living in was completely destroyed. But if we're going to talk about predators, Todd Spikes is one that should be mentioned. What made Todd different from the other predators on the show is that he didn't originally show up at the Stinghouse. 
Because of this, it was believed that he bailed out last second, and the Dateline's crew shut down the operation for the night. However, things took an unexpected turn as he would text a decoy at 1 in the morning, saying that he was going to arrive at the house. The police noted that he was suspiciously circling around the house in his van. This worried them, so they followed him around, and arrested the man before he had a chance to enter the house. While they searched his van, officers were shocked to find out that he carried numerous guns, a chainsaw, tarp, ropes, and a boat anchor. Also, during this time, Todd was a police officer, and it seemed that he was going to do much worse after his van got exposed. And let's just say, things were not looking good for him. It was later stated that he wasn't authorized to keep all those weapons in his van, and instead, he could have stored them in the police station he worked for. To put things in perspective, he carried 800 rounds of ammunition while off duty. Wow, that's totally not suspicious, right? While investigation was going on, officers were able to search his home when they discovered multiple unmarked VHS tapes with undisclosed content. Todd was arrested and fired from his job three days after the incident, where he was then quickly released on a $10,000 bond. He had to fight the charges against him for around three years, in which he finally accepted a plea to keep him out of jail. Now looking at what he was charged for and going back to the VHS tapes, it's safe to assume that we know exactly the type of content that were on those tapes. From all of this, Todd was given 10 years of probation and a lifetime registered sex offender status. However, only a couple years later, Todd was arrested at his home for violating the terms of his parole and while in prison, he fought another man, which only increased his time by another 3 years. Todd was a free man and this concerned many since his harsh actions led to minor consequences. The only other information I could find was that he worked at a family business known as Spikes Wholesale. It's also theorized that he could have lived in the store or nearby it, as one of his previous addresses was linked to the store, but as expected, this was never confirmed. Todd Spikes definitely should have received a much longer sentence, and many believe that he got away with it because he was a police officer and had power compared to other criminals. The last person we'll be looking at is Stanley Kendall, who at the time, shockingly admitted that he was a middle school math teacher. When questioned whether or not he had inappropriate conversations with students, Stanley replied that he successfully taught for 23 years and denied ever talking to any student in a sexual manner. To prove his innocence even more, he brought up the topic of religion and explained that the part of him that's Christian would persuade the child against having sex with him, to which Chris jokingly responds by saying this. So what part of the, the Bible tells you to say all this kind of stuff here in the chat. I'd love to suck play and suck play with like and lick nipple. After their conversation, Stanley would be arrested and during the police interview, he was extremely anxious and worried for his future as a teacher. Throughout the interview, he mentioned his career as a teacher and viewed himself as an excellent one. Adding on to this, he even states that his principal is going to be shocked when they find out about his arrest. This entire interview just proved that he did not care about what he did at all. He only cared about his career and how it would affect him. Following the arrest, his bail was sent to $50,000. However, in June 2007, Stanley's charges would be dropped, along with all the other predators that had been caught on the show. This was because of the death of assistant district attorney, Louis Conrad, a predator who himself after being caught on the show which eventually led to the show ending. After he was set free, the Texas Education Agency would permanently revoke Stanley's teaching license. But years later in 2013, he moved to Warsaw, Indiana, where he got a substitute teacher license at Plymouth Public School. No one knew about his background until a year later after someone recognized him. They notified Plymouth School's administration, and it had been discovered that he had been a substitute teacher for multiple school districts. He was also meant to work for another district named Penn Harris Madison, but before he could even transfer, the district was notified about his background, and so Stanley was removed from the system. What I find to be the most scary part about this is how all of his charges were dropped. Think about it, there was actual evidence against him, and just because of that person's death and the controversy surrounding it, everyone who made an appearance on the show, who are by the way evil people, got away free. And something that should be noted. Stanley taught for 7 years after the incident. With all the free time remaining due to never being able to get another career, 
Stanley spent a majority of his time chatting with older men online. Well, at least we hope they were older men. An infamous video appeared online that captured Stanley engaging in weird sex practices. For example, one of them included him consuming feces in his living room. The context behind this was never confirmed and thankfully, it wasn't. <laughs> But this once again showed that he never changed and was still the same disgusting man when he made his first appearance on the show. It was also during this time that he started to experience a decline in health, and just two years after the video, Stanley Kendall was announced dead on May 31st, 2017 due to colon cancer.